today's topic is what a young person born and brought up in the U.S., the amazing things he's doing in Kumau in India. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back with you once again. I'm very lucky that we have today with us a young man called Raj Bable. He is doing very, very interesting and amazing things in Kumau near the Himalayas. And I will ask, I will turn it over to him. And I'd first like to ask him, what is your key message today? Great. Thanks, Subod Uncle. So my key message is this, that high quality tea can not only be delicious for you as a tea drinker, but can also change the world by empowering farmers. Can I talk a little bit more about this? Yes, please. Okay. Well, let me start with a fun little fact, maybe yeah. a question for you. Um, did you know that black tea and green tea come from the leaves of the same tea plant? You're asking me or are you asking the audience? I'm asking you. Oh, I'm a tea drinker. I know everything about tea. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I was introduced, introduced to this somewhat remarkable fact when I was working in northern India in the Kumau region on a Fulbright Fellowship where the local tea farmers taught me this basic truth that all tea comes from the same plant. Yes. as well as one other little darker truth yeah. that due to tea's dark colonial history, the source of such joy for those of us who drink it is also a deep source of injustice for those who grow it. Okay. And this is not unique to tea, but rather food as whole. Generally okay. around the world, the farmers who grow our food often don't earn enough to feed themselves. Okay. And so Mountain Tea is involved with a larger movement of a lot of companies that are trying to shift that so that basically the people that provide the food that we eat three times a day, every day can support themselves because if it doesn't work for them, it's not going to work for us. And that was the origin working with farmers to raise the quality of their tea so that they can earn more and then raise the quality of their lives. So what a growing tree in Kumau before you went there. I mean, what was it? What was it like? Yeah. So Kumau is this region in Northern India for people who might not be familiar, right on the border with Nepal, Tibet is right in the Himalayas, the Himalayas where the mountains start to go up really quickly. Um, and tea was not really commercially grown in India before the British introduced it. And they did that in the mid 1800s. Um, and one of the regions that they planted out was this region of Kumau. And in fact, right in the same area, the first ever Indian tea to get drunk in Europe came from this region. But it was so far away from Kolkata, which was the British capital at that time, that they couldn't set up the supply chains to get the tea out of the mountains and to the port. So even though- There's the supply chain issues even back then. Oh, this is the original supply chain issues. <laughs> 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 yeah, these are playing humanity, I think, across time. <laughs> Probably will continue to for yeah, a while. Okay. Yeah, but basically, so the British established that tea could grow in this region, but couldn't set up a viable trade. So they abandoned these tea plants and for about 70, 80 years, they were just growing wild uh, with the exception of one tea garden. And that was a local family that had essentially throughout this six, seven decade window were the sole torch bearers of Kumau and tea. Um, in the late 1990s, the local government began cultivating tea as a way to create jobs for villagers. Um, and that was really a pretty forward thinking program. They got certified organic out of the gates um, they created a good incentive structure for farmers to actually take care of themselves. But the quality of the tea was really low. Um, and so when I was touring this in 2013, I was like, wow, the hardest part about growing tea is the growing part. Yes. Processing is actually comparatively, it takes, requires precision and artistry to do it well. But 99% of the effort is in the tea field. And the farmers are already very good at doing that. So we thought, let us see if we can bring in some resources, some expertise to help raise the quality of the processing. And that's why today we're launching the region's first farmer-owned tea processing facility um, to figure out how do you shift more of the value of tea into the hands of the farmers. Yeah. So it's a basic idea that where you grow tea, you process it. Because that's, that's, right. where, that's where the value added is. And that's where all the tastes, et cetera, come and the selection yes. and so on. Right. So good. So are you doing that? Yeah, we are doing it. It's actually just yesterday. Um, we're, we're pretty far into this process at this point. Most of the legal work to set up the entities, both in the US and India, are up. Um, the equipment, which is the exciting part, the kind of Willy Wonka uh, factory part, <laughs> to see who knows what we can create. We've, we've identified all the equipment that we wanted to use. 
Mm. Uh, we have the land purchased. We have the funding lined up. So I'm going back in about three weeks to take mm. next steps on that project. And fingers crossed, our first production run should be April of 2024. Okay, now let me show off. You know, you asked me, do you know something about tea? Is this yep. a CTC process or is it a whole leaf yeah. process? This is. A, thank you for that question. Yeah. So <laughs> I mean, for those who don't know, um, CTC is stands for crush tear curl. Right. It's a way of making tea that's very strong and brisk. So it, for making chai or anything that you're going to flavor the tea heavily, this is the right way to make it. Um, we are not pursuing that route. This is not CTC. Oh. It's whole leaf tea. Good, um, good, is, good. I'm happy. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> and these teas are intended to be drunk just by themselves, just the leaves in hot water. Um, no sugar, no milk, no flavorings. Of course, if you want to add that, you can, but the tea should stand by itself. Um, and that's really where we think um, there's an opportunity to increase the quality because this is sold mainly in the U.S., where I think the U.S. tea market and like all tea consumers is kind of where beer was in the early 90s where bud light is the sort of default and that's what we're familiar with but there's a craft uh segment emerging and so we're seeing the same thing in tea but it's taken about 30 years to catch up where there's this new recognition that really high-end teas have all these flavors that we never associated with the drink mm -hmm. um and that there's a whole world that's already ahead of this and, and familiar with it. So our work is just basically to catch up the American consumer, the American tea drinker, with what a lot of the rest of the world already knows. And a little fun fact is that tea is the world's most consumed beverage after only water. And that's a UN statistic. It's not just a tea lover's <laughs> positive. <laughs> it's certainly true in my life. <laughs> what kind of teas do you drink? Well, nowadays, one of the things I'm drinking is from the Lop Chu Tea Garden. Oh, fun. I'm not familiar. Yeah, it's there in uh, uh, South India. There's a one, it's like drinking Scotch whiskey single malt. It's from yeah. one tea garden, Lop Chu. It's yeah. not really easily available in the US, uh, right. but I get it from my friends when they come. Uh, yeah. It's, it's very good. But basically, what I'm usually after is a mix of Assam and Darjeeling. Mm. So a little okay. bit more of Assam because I need the strength. But yep. over the years, I've reduced the Assam strength in favor yeah. of the flavor of the Jarjiling. But I cannot drink like your tea, which I drank. I still can't drink it straight, you know, because I, okay. need, you like I, I need the strength. Right. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. So and sometimes Ceylon tea has that mix. What, uh, you know, Twining sells as English breakfast is like that. And Ceylon also has. So, yeah. But never mind, tell me about what, you know, what your plans are, what your future is, and how do you manage to work in a place where they speak Hindi? Yeah, well, um, the plans generally is to set up this first processing, first processing facility as a demonstration of what is possible, both from a quality perspective, as well as from a social and environmental perspective, sharing the ownership with the local community, and I did mention the environmental part, but yeah. um, this tea is being grown on land that has been abandoned. I mean, uh, urban migration is you know, a common challenge across yes. any rural part of the world. Yes. Um, and that's particularly true here. So the tea bush is being used to revitalize this abandoned land that has laid fallow as villagers leave for the cities. Um, and so establishing, can this, our, our, our hypothesis is that this one facility should be able to support livelihoods for around 500 farmers. Okay. So the plan is demonstrate that's possible and then replicate it, spread it across. Um, first, this other region I and mean, the rest of this region, Kumau, but ultimately the rest of the tea producing world. Um, and to do that, it really only works if you can find people who want to drink these teas. So right now our, our focus is on the US, but we're also talking for the first time to some um, people in Europe, in France um, specifically, and um, to spread as well to Japan. That's another country with a deep tea drinking tradition. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of on, on where we're trying to go with all of this. Uh, to your question of how we get by in a place that speaks Hindi, um, it's through partners. It's through a lot of deep relationships with the people that have are embedded in the communities. And so um, you remember probably this organization, Avani. Uh, who, yes, I remember. Yeah, we're still working with them. Um, they're a local nonprofit um, that for the last 25 years has helped in the issues of farmer empowerment. 
And so we've enlisted them and their support to help run these trainings with the farmers. Um, and we'll continue to sort of build on recognizing that being based in the US, my personal ability to affect change on the ground is somewhat limited. What I can do yeah. is help support access to markets and the flow of resources and bringing expertise in. But really the heavy lifting has to be done on the ground by people who are within the community, not from outside. So Abani is one partner. And then uh, we have a very close uh, personal um, connection to another tea farmer who his name is Desmond. Um, and he's the linchpin to this processing facility getting up and running successfully. He's been in tea for the last 25 years. And I mentioned there's one family that was sort of the torchbearers of the Kumau tradition between when the British left and when the government got involved, and it was his family. Um, and he's a biochemist by training. So thankfully, he can sort of blend Western science and, you know, mindsets. He is an Anglo-Indian, born of British descent, but in India. Um, he can merge that with the local context. And that kind of synthesis of approaches that take from the West and merge with whatever is there in the community is what we're, I mean, for me, that's the heart of it. That's the exciting part is to see what happens when cultures interact. Now, who's supporting you? Uh, a variety of folks. Um, yeah, USAID is one. Um, Acumen is an impact investor based out of New York that's supporting us, a customer. Um, Frontier Co-op is also involved. We have um, investors in the U.S. that are a mix of friends, family, and angel investors. And we've worked with a variety of family foundations, nonprofits, CDFIs. So, um, yeah, we've been fortunate to have resources from a pretty wide variety of stakeholders. And that's, I think, pretty fundamental to this type of work, you know, social entrepreneurship, which blends what's traditionally, you know, traditionally we've seen as you're a for-profit or you're a non-profit. If you're a for-profit, you're selling stuff and you're a capitalist or you're a non-profit, you're doing something really good and you're not making any money. <laughs> that's kind of, I'm being a little um, simplistic, but often that's sort of the way this kind of work is viewed. And so the idea is to bridge those two and have the funding support um, also mirror these two different realms that we're connecting. And you are the bridge. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> we're trying to be, we're, well, I'd say we're trying to build the bridge. Okay. <laughs> but it's, you know, one one brick at a time. <laughs> right. Okay, good. And what changes would you like to see? If at all from anybody or anywhere, what changes would you like to see? I mean, I would like people who drink tea to know where their tea comes from. Like, okay. Uncle, you know, you, you know the garden that your tea comes from. Yes. 99% of people who drink tea don't. And yeah. it's not their fault. It's that that information is intentionally withheld yeah. because as we were talking about before, the processing happens on location right after the tea leaf is harvested. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody else are intermediaries, including us. Yeah. And so what when a brand says like, this is our tea, unless they're doing something, often there is value that they're adding through flavoring or blending. Um, if they're not, if they're just presenting you black teas or green teas, they're just traders. And that includes ourselves. Um, so they, they're intentionally sort of blowing smoke into the supply chain so you don't know where it's coming from. And not to say that there's not a lot of hard effort in connecting the farmer to the market. Um, but I think that tea drinkers should know where their tea comes from. And that alone, I think, would transform a lot of the way we think about this drink, because the reality is that most of the tea that comes into the U.S., at least from India, um, is grown on corporate owned estates where the farmers are not seeing the benefits of their hard work. And for that reason, they're leaving. And right now, as an example, half of the estates in Darjeeling are up for sale because they're just going under because of the labor leaving, climate change related issues, um, and markets not responding. So I think that we need an alternative model. And that begins with consumers asking, where does my tea come from? Okay, that reminds me. How's yeah. your tea different from Darjeeling tea? Yeah. Uh, well, we do source from Darjeeling as well. So our collection has 30 different teas that we get from five regions, including Kumau is the sort of the, the starting point of our work. But we recognize early that it's difficult to offer a wide variety when you're at the very early stages of a region establishing its own in, independent identity. So we linked up with partners in Darjeeling, in Assam, and the Nilgiris in Nepal. And we also bring in their teas and offer them in the US. So across the board, what I say what makes our teas different is that they're single origin, meaning that they're coming from 
as you were saying, like single malt whiskey, the same thing. Yeah. It's from a yeah. single specific lot of a garden right. uh, that he gets processed. Yeah. Therefore, there's more of an artisanal touch. You taste the difference yes. in recognizing that there is nuance that is often masked or honestly intentionally blended out because there's going to be some variation. You know, what happened this year is going to be different than what happens next year. Correct. And when they blend, they intentionally are trying to give a very consistent flavor so you get the same cup every time. Right. They're trying to highlight and celebrate that there is season to season variation. That's part of the magic of being drinking a plant. <laughs> True. But if you were to tell somebody how you are different from Darjeeling tea, what would you say? I would say it's the terroir. It's the region. It's it's just like with wine. The difference between Malbec and say somewhere in France, it's the growing conditions that support the plant as well as the cultivar of the plants themselves. Those are the, probably the biggest high level differences. And Kumao teas is an example in comparison to Darjeeling. Darjeelings are known for having fairly floral, light, beautiful uh, right. black. Kumao has a different flavor profile. It's a little bit, there's, there's just naturally notes of almost cucumber or honeydew melon that are a little bit more vegetal and yet mm. sweet at the same time. And so as in, in terms of flavor, that's how I would describe the difference. In terms of practices, if the conversation were to go there, I would say Darjeeling is owned by estates. Um, yes. Large, large organizations that have essentially right. monocropped an entire mountainside and the communities that do the hard work on the farm don't own anything. They don't own the land, they don't own the tea bushes, they don't own the processing equipment. Often they don't own their houses and they're dependent on these estate owners for food subsidies, for healthcare subsidies, for education. And in contrast to that, the partners that we work with, there is ownership of the value chain. And as a, I don't want to go on too much, but shifting even the processing facility ownership to the hands of the farmers is a significant difference that we're doing uh, versus what's happening in Darjeeling right now. Okay, final question. How okay. do you find the government? the local, the state government, like the chief minister and other people and the mm -hmm. local officials, because that's always of interest, whether they help you or they hurt you or they hinder you. How do you find it? It's a bit of both. <laughs> it's an interesting dance that we're learning how to do um, in that the government program really, we have to give them credit for sort of revitalizing Kumau and tea as a whole. If the government hadn't gotten involved, there wouldn't be anything for us to do. Um, at the same time, where the government, I believe, in this region can be helpful is working with the farmers to grow the tea plant. Specifically, right now, they need to figure out how to increase their yield. Um, the amount of tea leaf that's produced per acre in Kumaon is very low compared to any other region. Um, what they're not good at is processing tea, and they're not good at selling it. Um, so they're making fairly boring teas that they're dumping into the auction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's... That's fine. I mean, it's not the government's role to figure out how to promote these teas. Um, but in the sort of establishment of a, our efforts to be complementary rather than competitive, mm -hmm. there's a lot of egos involved. There's a lot of changing faces involved. Like we start a relationship with one person and two weeks later, they're gone. Um, and so that's been the difficult part is figuring out how much effort to give to somebody that you don't know the next time you come back. There's a high likelihood they won't be there. A lot of times they don't have any familiarity with tea. They're just sort of climbing the ladder of bureaucracy and um, tea is where they're at in their career. Um, and so it's been challenging, I think, to figure out, to feel like we have real buy-in. Um, but thankfully that the gentleman Desmond, who I mentioned, he does a great job of bridging these two worlds because he worked for the government before quitting it to help us launch this facility. And so I say, Desmond, that's your headache. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, okay, Great. you tell the tea, I'll handle the government. Right. Okay, I think we will check back with you in maybe one year to see how much progress you make. Till Sounds then, good. let me say, I'm so impressed by what you are doing. It's an amazing piece of work to be up there in a region which is by no means any how natural to you. <laughs> but you are there and you are doing it. And I'm so proud that I know you and that you are doing it. So let's end with that and maybe we'll see you in a year. So let me say bye to my viewers and maybe you can join me in saying bye. Maybe if you know a word of Hindi or two, you could say that just to prove that you go to Kumau. <laughs> Great. 
आपसे मिलकर अच्छा लगा थैंक यू थैंक यू ओके बाय